honored to have three incredible authors here this afternoon for our session on authors revealed through music and poetry. Um, this is Gregory Spatz. Uh, his most recent book publication is a collection of novellas and stories titled What Could Be Saved. His novel publications include Eduction and Filler's Dream, and he's the author of two short story collections titled Half as Happy and Wonderful Trips. His stories have appeared in many publications, including The New Yorker, Glimmer Train Stories, Shenandoah, Epoch, Kenyon Review, and Windward Review. Uh, he's the recipient of a Missioner Fellowship, an Iowa Arts Fellowship, a Washington State Book Award, and an NEA Fellowship in Literature. He teaches at Eastern Washington University in Spokane. We have Andy Otto Parks, the author of The Bread and Water Body, the winner of the Merriam Frontier Chapbook Prize, and Song of Days, Born and Mended by Alice Blue Books. Radio Bloom, a first novel by Folded Word Press, and a book of poems, How to Remember the World, forthcoming from Foothills Publishing. She's a former editor of Writer's Digest, Fiction Writer Magazine, and Cup Bank Literary Magazine. She received her MFA, MA, and Doctorate of Education from the University of Montana, where she currently teaches writing. And uh, Heidi Harrison, a former teacher and psychotherapist from the San Francisco Bay Area. Now she uh, stares at towering cedars in a small town in the woods, the Puget Sound, and Seattle surrounding her. Inspiration and magic somehow seem to mingle as she writes novels, short stories, children's books, and a memoir. Look for her recently published lesbian romance novel, The Four Seasons, through Sapphire Books, and her stories in The Sun Magazine, and Shanti Arts, Still Points Art, Still Point Art Supporter. Like I often trail off while I'm like reading and get inside, so I'll try to stay reading loud. Um, so I'm actually going to read uh, my my panel that I proposed was to read out of Radio Bloom, which is a verse novel. So I'm going to read a little bit out of this. Um, but the book that actually just came out was this book. Um, so I'm going to kind of go back and forth, um, or not back and forth, just do a little bit of each. Um, but I, I also just want to start by thanking the Book Fest folks and um, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, you know, for letting us come in this awesome space. Meet everybody. Um, so this book, Radio Bloom, is a verse novel. I'm going to just start. It's a, it's a story. So I'll start at the beginning and piece a couple things. I'm just going to read for um, a few minutes out of it. Um, this book remains a thing as difficult for me to figure out what to even say to it about it by way of introduction. So I'm just going to um, kind of jump in. Prologue. Before you know the rest, you should know this. I live in a pleasant house on a quiet street in modern day Mayberry with mountains. I fell in love with my husband when I was still in my teens, and now we have a daughter and a son, and a dog and a cat, and a handful of sturdy fish. We have cabinets of bright coffee mugs and chipped plates for our toast. Usually there are flowers on the kitchen table. Usually music is playing. We have knickknacks from trips to Vegas and photos of us smiling, thumbs up on chairlifts over a white expanse of snow. We have closets full of vacuum cleaners and soft scrub and batteries and super glue and a green yard and a brown fence and crabapple trees and maples and aspens and a garage full of bike tires, scooters, sand buckets, rakes, ant poison, mouse traps, and long wooden boards which in the winter we used to build an ice rink where the kids slide back and forth laughing in the snow. We hardly ever lock the house. In the summer, we all eat dinner together on the back porch where the full thick leaves of the grapevines temper the evening sun. We live a kind of privileged normalcy that most people don't believe is real, but all of this is real. And so is this. Once there was a man who came to me and stayed, or he had always been there and never left, or he was a muse born of my prayers, or he was my every shame or my every fear or my every love risen up in the shape of a man, or he was a simple ghost trying to find the light. This is his story and mine. We met abruptly on the corner near the kid's school. He was running toward me, hand inside his jacket, searching for a weapon. I imagined a knife through my ribs or a cord around my neck, but then he was so close to me and I was afraid and could not move and his hand rose from the black coat and there was a golden gun lifted in the air and he fell toward me, plunging it through my chest and resting against my heart, gold against red, and the trigger went and I was exploded. I stood there on the corner. No one knew and no one saw a thing. I exploded and no one saw a thing. Is this possible? If you wonder, 
than you've never before fallen in love. At first he showed me the selves he wanted me to see. He was an icon, a legend, an officer in uniform with a clean square jaw. He was starched and stern and tasseled and, and badged, begun, bepowered, granted birth on a wide stage, was on a horse, on a motorcycle, in a fast car, was hanging from a cliff, was biceps and brawn, cursing in cigars and a leather jacket of disinterest. He loomed massive against the horizon. Might as well have been wearing a holster and a Stetson saying, talk low, talk slow, and don't say too much, yes sir, and crowing over the goddamn price of whiskey to his boys. He was a man that all women loved, all men even, I thought. When we walked together, he was shameless with the eyes. That loping half-smile, that habit of faux submission had remained, and his presence was huge. Every person he passed inflated, but he was always alone, this one. Walked off, hands in the pockets, and the others scattered like disinterested fish. In the beginning, he rarely left. He watched me from the picture window in my living room, sat above the fireplace, waited in the hot tub and shook his head. He was unimpressed by the fact of me emptying small cans of used tissue, washing dishes in pink rubber gloves, packing tiny bags of blueberries for lunch. How domestic, he said. He decided that he knew it was in my best interest, that somehow I had failed to honor our agreement, so he entered me by force, created a command post, sat in his sun-drenched, thatch-roofed hut while I fanned him, brought him bourbon and ice. He made sure that I understood the new power structure. My skin pulled heavy on my face. He told me I was tired and I believed him. Then he blew out of me like bees, left me like an empty hive, a voice with no body, a word with no print. He told me to ask him if I needed to know what it felt like to be human. While I weeded the garden, he stood on the fence and watched like there was a joke we shared, as though we had once spent an afternoon rowing a boat in the sun or spent an evening playing cards together. I could see he was afraid of me, that his laughter was nervous, that his eyes were averted, but not out of coyness. I had something he needed, and he was afraid I wouldn't give it to him, and yet when he left, I always knew myself more. I realized that I had let him in, that I could get him out, that I never would, that I would not know my life, that I would not know. He did not know that I was a thief by nature. He would look, me, look at me with gentle eyes, and it made me want to pull that Catholic curtain closed and confess everything. Lord, Father, how I have sinned. Outline all the ways I had deceived him. Tell him about this story I was stealing. But he was, had an improper idea of possession. And so I did not try to explain that these words were only his in the way that the arch possessed the raven through it, only the way the vase holds the lily. The catalyst does not own the explosion. And I remember that the urge to confess had been bred in me, that he was no innocent himself, that he had stolen plenty from my life, and that I didn't believe in sin, and I didn't believe in my own urge to false guilt. So I took from him as he took me apart. I looked through the window of him and took only the best pieces of myself. All right. This is a strange mystery of Radio Bloom. My daughter told me after hearing a couple readings of this, she was like, I heard the beginning so many times, why won't you read the end? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, um, why don't you read the end? <laughs> um, all right, so I want to read a couple of poems. I, I hope you'll indulge. So this book, um, How to Remember the World, I want to read in particular today because I know there's a lot made this week of this week being like palindrome week of September and also full moon and also Friday the 13th. And also yesterday was, uh, on top of all of those things, the 30th anniversary of my dad's death. And so it took me a long time, it's been a long time, but it took me a long time of writing about a million other things when everyone in my life was telling me I shouldn't be writing about my dad in some way, which felt really self-indulgent. But then I wrote a book about it, apparently. Um, so I just want to read a couple of those that are really, really about this exact time of year as kind of a haunting of if you have like a grief anniversary, how haunted a time of year can Verb of being. In seventh period Latin, we learned the verb to be by chanting sum es est, sumus estus sunt, over and over. I am, you are, he is. Beautiful William sat next to me in forward one, and his blonde hair fell into his eyes while he drew swords and busty, corseted women in blue or black ink. Sum es est, I am, you are, she is. Sumus, 
We are chanting the verb of being over and over while the hot autumn sun poured in and our teacher, the old man, marched the aisles with a long pointing stick. And I chanted too, I am, you are, he is, in that big old school building without knowing that somewhere across the valley my father was marching through the rituals of diagnosis, the MRI machine, the CAT scan, the blood draw, listening quietly while all the doctors talked. I chanted, he is, we are, they are, while he learned about the tumors, about his blood boiling with virus. I watched beautiful William toss his blonde hair in the sun, and I absentmindedly traced the outlines of the pencil carved graffiti on my desk. Sum es est, sumus estes sunt, the marching song. We are, we are, he is, beautiful William. Est, he is an old man with a stick. Est, she is a woman helping her husband to walk down the white hallways to get in and out of bed. Est, she is a nurse who will come to love. Sum, I am 12. I am a daughter still of a father for 11 months more. Sunt, they are misdiagnosing. Est, he is afraid. Est, he is trusting. Sum, es est, sumus estes sunt. The old man marches in my dreams, marches his language song from room 317, from September of 1988 forward, through the dusty tables of the kitchens and bedrooms, offices and libraries of my life, through all those years teaching us, in the present tense, our first lesson, to be, to be, to be. So one of the things to kind of tackle in the manuscript I'm working on right now is, I think, a memoir, I think, I don't totally know, um, is kind of the confusion of memory, right? Trying to know what you remember and what you don't remember and what you're trying to remember but maybe never happened. Um, and so I was teaching a workshop where we were trying to find a really common memory um, so not something spectacular, but something really common to write from. And so, as sometimes happens, I wrote a poem from that exercise too, um, which is this poem. It's called The Vault to the Birds. I was mopping because I had been asked to mop. I know it was a Saturday in 1989, and it was spring or summer. I know this because most of the time we spent together was in the evenings, and this particular day was sunny. And Saturdays were always our days. And I know that it was spring or summer, because before and after that, you were too sick to have been standing there watching me. It was 1989 for sure, because by September, you were dead. I know that we were alone because we were never alone, and the fact of our aloneness, read not togetherness, made the house feel too big and too open and too quiet, and as though all the conversations we hadn't ever said aloud had swarmed back, crowding the room like dark birds at the windows, waiting to dive through the tiniest opening. Or maybe it was the words you couldn't find that had made the air turn thick, made my throat tight. I don't know. But the bright, silent kitchen was a vault in which I cleaned. I mopped the light linoleum in a fever. I knew you were watching me while I worked, and I knew right then that you believed you were going to die. I knew but didn't want to know that that moment, me slopping a wet mop across the floor in the kitchen, was a moment you were filing away. I could feel you trying to see everything, to gather every small crumb into a monument of normalcy. I could feel you beginning to cry behind me, and so I didn't turn around because I was supposed to keep going, because you were hoping to hold on to it, to carry this terribly common thing across space and time, and my job was to say, look, I know how to do these things, so it's all going to be fine. I knew that you were trying to see me as the girl I was then, but you were also trying to see into the teenager, the college student, the mother, the wife, and the so many people I would become without you. But I never looked because I couldn't hold your silence. I didn't want to feel like I was doing it all wrong. I didn't want to see into the hours of my own life that I would give to cleaning floors and wiping counters. I didn't want to imagine the lifetime I would spend trying again and again to clear some room, to make things nice, to make some space to live in. My, I think the last poem that actually named September in it that I'm gonna read, but I, this is the best, this is one of my favorite fall poems because it's really about fishing um, as sort of a metaphor, I guess, for grief, kind of. It doesn't really work out if you read it too close, but that was how I was thinking of it. Um, it's called A Mouthful of Hook Scars. September, you are an angler in the brook, waking early to stand in certain cool and warming waters. You plan for this with hours of folding pheasant tail or rabbit fur into tiny bound bodies, wind or legged, sure to catch what you come for. It would be too simple to say that I am the fish, but for me you grow quiet. For me you are still watching the water for shadow and rise. 
After all these years, there is still something I cannot say, something gone silent in the dropping off. Too many summers gone, released like the others, the torn mouths, the thin red ribbons of blood blurring pink, then gone in the current. I am no fool. I know your glassy arc of line across the water, your lumbering shadow, your slow persistence in your peacock plumes. I rise out of safety to be alive on the end of that line, to send you the whip kick weight of my shining body, arched beautifully in fear, pulled up from this catch in the throat, this something I swallowed so long ago. I come to flash green gold in my descent, lip full of the forest, the hair of the elegant buck, the black eye bead that stares into the rush. I come because all the sense I've made of anything is muffled by a mouthful of hook scars or porcupine barb or barred turkey quill. And even if nothing more comes, I have gathered evidence of these seasons, evidence of you beneath yellowing leaves, your hands busy with all of your brilliant false offerings. Um, so uh, some of the other things that happen in this book are really thinking about health as a, um, an experience instead of an object, right? Um, and so I have a series of poems about various health things. And so this is called Dear Heart um, for the Arrhythmic, which if the arrhythmia is where your heart just won't ever get in rhythm, right? Or it does, and then it kind of falls out of it. Dear Heart. And when I say this, dear heart, I don't mean to conjure a deer's heart, pumping hopeless and wild around the puncture of a hunter's arrow. Nor do I mean dear heart as in sweetie pie, honey, or my love. What I mean to do is address you, my heart, the incorrigible fish thrashing against my ribs. You, the thick-valved compass guiding me from the womb since before I had hands or hair or lips. You, the fat red clock rocking me across the hot tarmac of life, saying no, walk away, or always forgive, or yes, love him, and often, do it if you must, but it will crush me. So far you have freighted me onward, lurching forward and falling back like the town drunk, trying to find comfort, because my dear, I have been unkind to you, cracking you open with life's hammers. Is it too late to say I love you, that I study and follow your steady directives, to say that I pray to you like a thing I have already lost? This poem, I just have two more for you guys. Um, this poem, um, I guess what you need to know, is for my father-in-law. So my father-in-law died also pretty recently, just a couple years ago. And there were a lot of circumstances of his death that have remained really mysterious that we won't ever really know the answers to. Um, so this is for Ed. After he died, I shoveled snow at night in the black bracing cold when the sky was bright with stars. My gloved hands pushed and lifted and turned the thick wooden handle as the full moon emerged slowly from behind the mountains because the earth's turning pulled the mountains away from the moon. I shoveled in the still coming snow trying to return things impossibly to the way they had been and I worked to ignore what I knew. Everything we clear will be covered. I tossed the snow up into the air for the dog to bite because her joy was insatiable and the moonlight made scatter shadows that would kick out and fade. The neighbor was trying to go somewhere. The car tires spun peacock plumes of snow before catching tread and the engines revving cracked the silence, but the swallow was swallowed into echo as the car's back end swung out in thick slaloms onto the road. I stood still in the cold to feel the heat in my coat, to feel the snow's small dapples on my hot neck, to feel my breath heavy and alive with work, and to pray again my prayer to the past. Please, I asked the sky in the thin, cold air, please let his death have been like this like thick snow falling, the kind that whispers, shh, quiet now, the kind that catches your breath, that startles you up out of yourself with its beauty. The last piece I have for you guys is really short. It's the title poem from the book, How to Remember the World. Consider the quiver of stones in your pocket, each one saved for the slingshot. Roll them in your palm like lead musket or buckshot. Hold one between your fingers and study it up by the light as though it was sapphire, emerald, diamond. Bring it so close to your face that it becomes the entire size of your vision. As a child, you did this until you know only the graniteness of the thing. Hold your fingers near. See the scar from the paring knife, the tiny lines of dry skin, the pores exhaling what you no longer need. Know the stoned black roundness, the curve between your fingers. Soon, you'll draw it back in the leather grip 
and release it to purpose. Don't move a muscle. Don't even blink your eyes. read from this new book. I'll say a few things about it, and I promise the reading will be more than like five minutes. Um, so I wanted to say uh, say a few words about the form of this book. It's, it's called What Could Be Saved, and I've been calling it Book Matched Novellas and Stories. So the term book matched comes from woodworking, and specifically applies to violin building, which, as you can see from the cover, of the, book. the book is all about the violin trade, building, buying, selling, trading, playing, stealing violins. What it refers to, if you can imagine a violin in its most raw state as the trunk of a tree, maple for the back and spruce for the top, and the round of wood that the trunk makes, book matching is the process by which you would split out V-shaped or pie slice shaped pieces from that wood round and then take those two pie slices of wood and you match them or flat joining them back to back so that the grains run out from the center seem like a mirror image of each other. So this is what's meant by book-matched pieces of wood. And the term, as it turns out, comes from letterpress printing and from books, meaning that the figure or flame in the two pieces of book-matched wood should look like lines of text in an open book. So I stole the term back from woodworking to use for a book, and what I think I mean by this is that the stories and novellas, while they do have some more typical sorts of narrative links, shared characters and things like that, should really stand alone, but they are meant to be twinned to each other and matched, and are meant to resonate against one another, like the <coughs> book matched lumber or the parts of a violin. They share a grain and a figure and a purpose more than they share narrative links. So, what else should I say? Uh, it took me until fairly late in writing what could be saved to realize that in most ways the book is a meditation on destiny, destiny and tradition as seen through the lens of the violin building world, a world with a unique and distinct sense of traditions and practices extending back hundreds of years and a world in which there's the somewhat unusual expectation that the trade and practice will be handed off over multiple generations. I was interested in seeing how characters might resist or accept what seems like destiny and how the sense of destiny would collide with the modern world where there's such an emphasis on choice. So the first novella is called What Could Be Saved? It features a young man named Paul who has refused to follow in the footsteps of his violent builder father. He doesn't entirely understand or necessarily want to understand why he's so resistant. So resistant. Um, and in the the story's top action, he's in his fourth year of college and basically failing to find a clear direction academically and otherwise is not entirely lost, but something close to it. None of which you really need to know because I'm going to read a passage that's from early, early on. It's actually the first thing I wrote for this novel. It ended up not being the opening of it, but it's... Um, it's close to the opening. Anyway, it's, so it's a flashback to when he was a little kid, so you don't really need a lot of setup and you don't need to know how old he is in the top action, but I just told you anyway, so you can contextualize it for yourself. Um, so, and I'll just read this little passage here. Growing up, Paul hardly touched a woodworking tool. For one thing, there was his father's sovereignty. No sense competing against a man whose trade had so fully defined him and that he in turn had helped to define and in which he'd spent his entire adult life in a state of complete and selfless absorption. The notion of comparison or competition was irrelevant. His father had already won. He had pre-won. He had always and would always have pre-won. And anyway, he wouldn't have consented to competition and challenge in the first place. You want to build, he'd say? Too happy, too willing to share. Paul knew this. We'll start with scraping some ribs. Let's go. There was more to what kept him out. Still, he hadn't found the right words for it. Only a shrug when customers of his father used to ask about his plans and whether he might someday try his hand, take over the business. Sure, doubtful, I don't know. At first, he felt he was saving the option. Why or what he was saving it for, he couldn't have said. Seen what his father had gotten for his sovereignty and dedication, 
a room full of molds, models, tools, rare violin books full of color plates, mentions in the Strad magazine medals and certificates, a daily activity to engross him without any break ever, a clientele that hung on his words and trusted him in all matters violin related and treated him with the deference of a sage or guru, but without understanding what he did and without fairly compensating him. Fingers that reported back to him in ways he could neither describe or calibrate, yielding knowledge of how a piece of wood was going to respond under pressure. Orders that came all at once or not at all. When he was younger, Paul would spend afternoons and slow times on weekends in the shop. He learned the names of tools and processes and occasionally helped his father to select wood blanks for a new instrument. In retrospect, he supposed his father could only have been humoring him. Once, when he was nine, he surprised them both with an ability to identify differences between the scrolls and corners of various old Italian makers and one of the books of color plates his father kept in the workshop. That one's a Strad, and that's a Guarneri, right? This, the shape of this, whatever it's called, and this is a Magini. He flipped more pages and kept going, Strad. How he knew, he couldn't say. The names were already familiar. He'd been seeing and hearing them for as long as he could remember. The shape to go with each seemed only a natural, logical extension, and an easier way to tell one thing from another. Isn't that interesting, his father said. You figured that out all on your own? Really? Hey, look at me. You're cheating. You read the chapter titles. And when Paul shook his head no, his father asked, what's this one then? Amadi? Excellent. That's excellent. Great eye. And this? And this? His father flipped randomly to a page in another book, the paper scuffed and dented with ghosts of his own handwriting. Letters, numbers, lines transferred through tracing paper. A brown half ring of varnish or spilled black and floated to one side of the image like a cookie with a bite out of it. The finish of the violin and the picture blown open in the middle, pigmentation darkest at the edges, reminded Paul of the uneven film of suds and color left in his parents' beer glasses after dinner. Look here, his father said. No guesses? I don't know, Paul said. His father tapped two fingers on the page and traced the outline of the seed out. He drew in his lips and puffed air through them in a way that normally indicated amusement, but here seemed to mean something else. While his fingers continued moving up and down as if the violin's shape corresponded with some unspoken longing or mystery. Lake Warneri, he said, spent a lot of time with this one, as you can see. He ended by brushing his fingers along the spilled varnish. I don't know, his father said, fairly atypical for the rest of his work, right? You might say he was slipping a little in his old age, dipping into the sauce or rushing to get the orders out, messing up his blocks. Still, it's so uniquely beautiful. It's a paradox. What do you think? Would we let an instrument go out of the shop looking like that? Being included in his father's attention to violins this way was like standing under one of the high-powered lights by his workbench and seeing all the grains in your fingernail and the bits of dead skin on the surface of every wrinkle on the back of your hand. Such clarity, it was a form of erasure. If he said any more, he'd fail them both. The look on his father's face now, too, was so much the same as when he first examined an instrument he'd recently finished. Lifted at arm's length, he dangled his chin to one side and the other, nodding, grunting, spinning the instrument back to front, front to back, nodding some more. Not bad, not bad. Measuring against some internal standard until it dawned on him, the imperfection, the flaw or flaws, whatever inscrutable details or misbegotten choices among all the better details and choices cause the final product to fall short of some ideal. It was all Paul could do to remember to keep breathing. I don't know, he said. It's okay, his father said. I was actually trying to trick you. Never mind. Not fair. I'm impressed, though. You have a real visual sense. I wonder where you came by that. The next several days after this, his father was busy varnishing new instruments and between coats, finally getting serious about an overdue restoration job on an old violin that had been mostly destroyed in a house fire. Paul watched from the leather chair by the window and tried not to interrupt with questions or suggestions. Please, his father would say, please, not today. The restoration job was a torment for him, not only because of the painstaking work of building the plates back splinter by splinter, but because something about agreeing to take it on put him at odds with a dealer in the city. Double for nothing, he explained. Oldest trick in the business. You total the instrument, scam the insurance, sell the customer a new violin with the claim money. 
later, whenever you feel like it, when no one's looking, you fix the so-called total violin. Write some new papers so no one's the wiser, and off it goes. It'd be like, here he paused, hands on his head, say I owned a toy store, and I took one of your transformers and broke it. Well, maybe I don't break it, but it gets broken somehow. And then I tell someone to pay you to buy another one from me, top dollar, by swearing that the first one can't ever be fixed. Uh, never mind. This made no sense to Paul. No, his father said, bending again to his work. Of course not, because as soon as anyone decided it was a good idea, charging crazy money for old Italian violins, as soon as that happened, it became the most corrupt business in the world. It doesn't make sense. And before and after dinner, more of the same, complaining to his mother, can you even imagine, he said, all she wanted was her Obichi back. Still, for weeks afterward, hoping his father might remember, a real visual sense, I wonder where you came by that. He went around mumbling the names of builders, hoping his father would overhear. Obichi, Del Gesù Guarneri, Tononi, Bergonzi, Stradivarius. A kind of incantation, recitation to invite attention, to get his father to lift his eyes like that again, full of wonder, really seeing him. But this never happened. Eventually, he stopped waiting, let the few little projects he'd begun, a clumsy top <coughs> of wide grain spruce, a neck blank of flawed wood, nicked and scarred around with rasp marks, a handle for his own knife. He let them gather dust, kicked aside in a box under the bench. Who had spurned or forgotten whom, he couldn't say, but long after the visit stopped and other after-school activities took up his time, chess club, swimming, track, the cedar chip walk between the house and his father's workshop felt raw to him. A nightmare tightrope walk past a chasm, a place not to let your eyes linger. I'll stop that. Okay, so um, I'm going to be reading from the Four Seasons, my novel which uh, takes place in this part of the world, and also Australia. And um, before I start, though, I want to say that um, thank you so much for being here. And also, I love this topic that we are it's in our midst. Lives revealed through poetry and music. As if our lives are obscured. As if our lives are these hidden beings, and what brings it out, what allows those lives to be revealed is poetry and music. Um, and hearing about the violin, which I'm going to be doing, talking about as well, and the poetry, which, which was exquisite. It's, it's, it's how words and music transcend our simple, banal life bring us to that place where existences are revealed that are normally underneath. So I love that topic. It was chosen by me. It was chosen by the presenters of, of the, the book, yes. the festival. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, the book festival. So this is a novel. Um, I'm not going to really get into all of the, the details of the novel, because that's not really what um, is going to be connecting with this topic. But I mostly want to say um, there is the main character, Irene, and she is a music professor at the University of Washington. And um, she is a professor for all incoming freshmen where um, they are in Music 101, and she wants the students to really grasp what is music and how does it connect with our lives. Um, and specifically the Four Seasons, Vivaldi, and she uses seasons, and she unveils the seasons through music. And in this unveiling, she connects our human essence to that of nature. That the seasons aren't just winter, spring, summer, fall, but they're so deeply layered. And how are they layered? And how does music really bring that whole element out? So what I'd like to do is to be Irene and to do a bit of her lectures through my writing here and to bring out some of the music because I, a friend of mine actually um, told me I actually had to do the Spotify because I have a lot of, uh, lot of music references in this book. So I did that and I um, um, took this sort of elicit the, the feeling rather than saying this is Vivaldi's autumn season, you know, concerto. What is the autumn concerto? 
as you are reading it. So music isn't just words, because music goes beyond that exquisite poetry. <laughs> music is, is so much more into the soul of a printed word on a page. So I wanted to get a little bit of that. So. I have a few sections. The first one is just a few sentences, just to get you the just what your what your appetite for what music is and how music can be um, described with words, even if you don't have a music in front of you. She was silent then. Her story done. Helena stared out the window at the sea, feeling called to reach it somehow. Her dad, his voice the legacy they created that she now held in her heart. Irene stared, too, at the water. I feel a voice sing, a requiem, cadences and harmonies that align with the dead, our fathers, their spirits, and what remains they leave for the living, the daughters, us. Irene said, her own voice drifting toward the water as they both stared at it. And I want to go into her actual lecture that she um, is doing. The middle of October in Seattle, while technically falling under the category of autumn, begins its early descent into the throes of winter. Gray skies follow gray skies, and rain follows rain. Leaves, once pubescent in their vibrancy for life, fall mercilessly to the ground, and the bare nakedness of trees erupts, sometimes all in a night if there is ample wind. The cold and damp sink into the skin, into the walls, and gardens become obliterated by a sea of dead brown leaves. And she speaks. Let's go to the musical literature. What has been written and composed in honor and in celebration of autumn? The fact is, my dear students, we are all here now, and autumn is lashing out its fury outside. Some of you may have lost power. I did. Its Puget Sound's energy's wrath on humans in a blemished world. Of course, we begin with Vivaldi, probably the most well-known. Here we are in the midst of the themes of art and the harvest, wine and ale overflowing that is juxtaposed with an inward melancholy, a folding in of the earth, and a loosening of the skin, the leaves falling and disappearing under the ground. The poem that inspired his auto concerto. The cup of Bacchus flows freely, and many find their relief in deep slumber. The singing and the dancing die away, as cooling breezes fan the pleasant air, inviting all to sleep without a care. So you probably know this, but feel on it. Concerto with the theme of the hunt. Other composers have surged in the realms of a haunting beauty of this time of melancholy. Let's listen to Barber's version of the violin concerto that is for me the epitome of this inward beauty that is ascribed to the season of autumn. Can you 
element of wind and rain that is so present in the autumn, especially here in the Northwest, where the rain doesn't seem to stop. In John Adams' Shaker Loops, in the violins, we can feel the leaves rustling in the wind, the rain falling. In the last century, George Winston was indeed at the forefront of evoking muse of the creative feeling, a mood. He composed an entire album called Autumn, titling his sections Woods, Longing, Love, Colors, Dance, Moon, Sea, Stars. Let's listen and see if you can get a ta true taste of Autumn from his music. From there, and finally, let's go to the soundtrack of the film The Village. Again, we hear such rich, haunting sounds, the music and the strings. It just makes you feel like running in the cold. Listen and feel the music. Let it sink into you, too.
Irene paused after the last piece, which sang at everyone's core and left them speechless. As she observed that some students were crying, she imagined that they might be thinking of people they knew who died. Some were imagining making love, and still others were visualized being in that moment, standing in the rain, in a barren field, letting themselves get entirely soaked. Go home, my dear students. Feel the autumn enter you. Listen to all this music again, and write a minimum five-page piece about one of them, or maybe two, interlocking the theme. The class, for the first time, walked out silently into the rain, feeling the intensity of music. As they wrapped their scarves tighter around their necks, if even they had scarves, as they walked into the wind that whipped around every corner of campus, Irene hoped each of those students felt immune somehow to the cold, to the autumn's melancholic curse. She dearly hoped that they felt happy, each of them, in their own ways, as some of them skipped through puddles, as others kicked leaves that fell around them, watching them dance, remembering the violin and its melodious resonance, reminding them of the beauty of it all. Are we doing on time? We're almost out of time. Okay. Uh, you want to read one more, or if you want to take any questions? Some questions, okay. Yeah, questions, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. starting out, no idea. 
not at all. The, the stories kind of told me that's what they needed to become. And it was fun. It was totally fun. And then in the end, totally unmarketable. <laughs> I would say very similar. Like, no, I just wrote the whole book, and then it took me a long time to revise it and figure out what genre it could possibly be and what form it could actually even be in. And that seems to be like what I just tend to do. Like, I have a whole book manuscript that I finished over the summer, and then I finished it and was like, well, now I don't know what it is at all. Like, I, it's definitely not like one of these, but it is definitely a finished draft. But the more I start tinkering with revising it, the more each section is turning into a short story or like a, a flash story. And so then I'm, now I'm kind of like, well, maybe it's a long fiction piece. Yeah, I, I, it's really hampering for me to worry about what the final product would be, except for trying to get the whole thing finished and then afterwards. There's nothing yeah. against people who work from outlines. Yeah, yeah, lots yeah. of people do, and lots of really good writers write from outlines. It's just not me. I can't do that. Yeah, I don't write from outlines. I, I, had a, I had the characters in my mind evolving, and I'm a violinist as well, and so I've spent most of my life playing the violin, and so I have never put I've never put music to words, and so that was kind of kind of inspiring. Actually, I would just stare at the trees like. Now that's how I, I stare at trees and that's how, that's how I write. And so as I was staring at trees, the words of music were coming in and I write that way. And so I never really know when I sit down in the morning what I'm going to write, but if things evolve. But the more I was able to put music into words and connect them to something like seasons and to, to really do more research on composers I didn't know, the more it just brought to life how beautiful music is and how difficult it is to describe music. Music is, a, is, a, is an essence uh, versus uh, something that you could actually put into something literary. And so it was, it, was that, it was a challenge to do that because so much is left for that soul quality that music does. But um, so it was, it was lovely to write it and to just have it happen as it happened. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.